Thank you very much, uh, Bob, for this uh, uh, kind introduction. Um, it's a real honor and delight to thank you. It's a real honor and delight to uh, to be invited to to give this uh, talk for BMOX. Uh, BMOX is something that I grew up with as a trainee in the West Midlands. Uh, it's also a, a, a delight and a pleasure to uh, to be visiting Greece for the first time. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your hospitality. Um, so I'm I'm going to take you through. Uh, a journey about uh, what we do uh, in obstetrics and its impact on um, childbirth-related pelvic floor dysfunction in general. Um, just a bit of declaration, I'm not a urogynecologist, so I have a vested interest to protect the pelvic floor, unlike urogynecologists who will not have a vested interest, um, <laughs> otherwise they run out of business. Um, some of the images and the videos on, uh, uh, on, in this presentation are in the public domain from online resources. I run multi-professional training workshops, and we have a training model, but any royalty fees or honoraria goes to fund um, research into this field. I am also um, a lead a, a European group related to perineal trauma, and when we set this group, it's, it was always difficult to decide what we're going to call ourselves. This is something that came to, uh, um, as an idea, um, but we decided this might not work very well. Um, so this is the perineal trauma peers, and peers stand for prevention, evaluation, education, repair, and scanning. Um, and this group has been working together for over five years now. Some of the information in this presentation are generated by this group. Before I start the talk, I want to set some rules. Um, so the title contains the word prevention, um, and um, I don't think that prevention in this talk will mean stopping it altogether, because the only way to stop it altogether is to do something similar to what Zeus done in Athena's birth, to deliver Athena from his head rather than anywhere else. This is the only way you can protect your pelvic floor. Maybe the other alternative is contraception, because this is another way of protecting the pelvic floor. But anything that involves a pregnancy and childbirth will have an impact on the pelvic floor, undoubtedly. I also want to set some rules as to what we mean by pelvic floor dysfunction in this context. Um, the uh, Yuga and the ICS have had a, a, a publication in 2010 um, this defining some terminologies that are used in gynecology about pelvic floor dysfunction. And they came up with 250 definitions of pelvic floor dysfunctions. So I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to focus on the big players, urinary incontinence, anal incontinence, perineal trauma, Oasis in particular, obstetric anal sphincter injuries, which, is, which are third and fourth degree tears, and levator and eye avulsion. This is a very special woman. Um, she is very special because she's from Egypt, where I come from. Uh, but she's also very special because this is the first woman known to us in history to sustain a, a perineal trauma at the time of childbirth. And the reason we know about this is because she was a royalty, so she was mummified, and then you can tell from the mummy that she had really quite extensive perineal trauma. Probably, actually, sadly, she um, died during childbirth because of that. But many, many years later, childbirth trauma is something that is very significant. And I'm going to quote UK figures because this, these are figures I'm familiar with. It affects a significant number of women per year. Certainly, we, do, we seem to be doing worse rather than doing better. So when it comes to obstetric anal sphincter injuries, they are on the rise over the past 12 years. The incidents have gone up from just under 2% to nearly 6%. A significant number of women, I don't know whether you're aware of this figure or not, but 30% of women after their first delivery will have a, an element of urinary incontinence. 13 to 36% of women will have a levator avulsion. And certainly a significant number of women who have levator avulsion end up with prolapse. I'm going to take you through some data which are really quite pertinent to, to the talk from the Prolong study. The Prolong study is the, is the longest study um, for, for follow-up for women who um, have had a delivery and they were followed up um, after a few months and then later on at six and 12 years. The Prolong team, which I have not been a member of, I've just joined the team recently, um, have already published the data up to 12 years, but now they're applying for funding to, um, so that we can generate data for 21 years after the, the childbirth and what happens to the pelvic floor. And when you look at the data from Prolong, if you look at urinary incontinence for this cohort of women, the problem happened initially and seems to, be, seems to get worse by time, which is something that probably most of the audience here will be aware of. Likewise, with fecal incontinence, of course, the, the incidence is much less than urinary incontinence, but it's, again, the same situation. 
the big hit happens at the beginning, but then it continues to get worse. So what about mode of delivery? Is the answer then uh, for mode of delivery to do cesarean sections? When you look at prolonged data, interestingly, cesarean section seems to half the risk of a woman developing urinary incontinence after birth, as long as all the deliveries have been by cesarean section. So if somebody has a vaginal birth and don't like it, and the second time they want a cesarean section, they've already had the hit. So there is no point in doing cesarean section to protect, to protect the pelvic floor. But when we say it halves the risk, the risk is still very high. So 15% of women who only deliver by cesarean section will have a degree of urinary incontinence, which again is, is, is quite a big figure. And if you think about that this is a problem that is going to get worse by time, then maybe cesarean section is not the answer. When it comes to fecal incontinence, interestingly, cesarean section is not protective, so it does not reduce the risk of fecal incontinence. However, forceps delivery increases the risk significantly of a woman ending up with fecal incontinence even without an obstetric anal sphincter injury, or at least a, a diagnosed one. And again, this data is confirmed from a systematic review. If you look at anal incontinence in a cohort of women who have had cesarean section compared to cohorts of women who had vaginal birth, there is no difference whatsoever. So you can see the forest plot, every, all the effect size is bang on the line of no effect. So it does not protect from that. What about parity? Is the solution to reduce the number of babies? Well, the data from parity are really very interesting because whether you have one, two, or three babies, the risk is the same. So the biggest hit happens with the first baby. If you have four or more, then the risk becomes much higher. But for people to have just one baby rather than three babies to protect the pelvic floor also does not seem to work. So relying on parity on its own does not seem to have a big effect unless if you are going to avoid very high parities. And this data again confirms, comparing, uh, uh, this is a systematic review uh, from the Thom and Rodvert group, and again, they have demonstrated that the risk for primips of having urinary incontinence is very, very much similar to the risk of, um, uh, of all parities and particularly multips. So the conclusions from uh, the, this first uh, batch of slides is that the largest impact happened from the first delivery. So if you can just have your second child straight away, it might be a good uh, answer, as Abdul Sultan says. And also, cesarean section does not abolish this risk. And this is really a very important take-home message because we could be conveying the wrong message to women, making them choose cesarean section, imagining that they will protect their pelvic floor. So what can we do? Because it's all grim up to now. What can we do to reduce this risk? And I'm going to take you through, take you through some of the interventions that we do at, at the time of childbirth to see the impact of this on, um, on um, outcomes when it comes to pelvic floor disorders. Antenatal interventions, is there anything that we can do during the antenatal period that can reduce the risk of pelvic floor dysfunction? And this is a systematic review from Boyle et al, uh, published in 2012. And antenatal pelvic floor exercises reduce the risk significantly. They reduce the risk of a woman ending up with urinary incontinence by 30% if they start the pelvic floor exercises at 20 weeks and continue doing so until delivery and afterwards. When we look at our, our cohort of women at the Birmingham Women's Hospital about antenatal pelvic floor exercises, this is a small group of women, but I, I think very generalizable data. We asked the women, nearly half of them could not recall that anybody told them to do pelvic floor exercises, although it's part of the NICE guidance. And the ones who were, could recall that they were told, the majority of them were not doing them. They were not doing them because they did not think they were important, because they did not know what they should be doing, because you have to put in mind that a significant number of women, and maybe men, but I don't see men in my clinics, but a significant number of women are not able to locate their pelvic floor. And, of course, a significant number of women forgot to do them, which is quite understandable. The day is busy, there are lots of things happening in life, it gets busier postnatal, so women don't do them. But the problem with pelvic floor exercises is that they are only effective if it's a structured program, if you can make sure that the woman can locate and contract her pelvic floor. And this is an RCT done by um, Carrie Bow from uh, Denmark. And the difficulty, of course, is how can you assess the pelvic floor contraction? The only way that we do it is maybe by scanning, which is not convenient every time you see a patient in the antenatal clinic. Vaginal examination, very frowned upon during the obstetrics period. Lots of women are not happy to do it. Certainly midwives are not happy to do it. That's why we went back to the original Kegel exercises. And the Kegel, in his description in 1942 about the exercises, said something very interesting. The reason why Kegel thought about the pelvic floor exercises is his observation, whether it's right or wrong, that tailed animals 
do not develop incontinence because of pelvic floor disorders. Because every time the animal wags its tail, it's doing a pelvic floor exercise. And they, then he came up with this idea that pelvic floor exercises should happen all the time and strengthen the pelvic floor. So if we think about evolution, the tail that is left to us is the coccyx. And that's why with the team in Denmark, we developed a test that is now published called the coccygean movement test. And this is, this is if, if you actually palpate the coccyx on top of light clothing and the woman contracts the pelvic floor, you feel the coccyx moving forward and it's, a, a, it's as effective as vaginal examination in determining a pelvic floor contraction. The good thing about it is that you can do it also in any position. With vaginal examination, it's very artificial. The woman is in lithotomy, she's lying uh, on her back, which might not be necessarily the, the, the same position that she would take to do pelvic floor exercises. So the conclusions from this is that I think we're missing a, a significant opportunity with pelvic floor exercises. Obstetricians, we don't maybe believe in them. Certainly midwives don't believe in them. Um, patients are too nice to tell us that we, they don't know how to do it, so they always say, yeah, yeah, of course, I'm doing my pelvic floor exercises, but they're not. However, this will have to be structured. They have to make sure the woman can locate these muscles. Actually, it can reduce the risk of incontinence by doing antenated pelvic floor exercises with the same impact as doing a cesarean section. What about interpartum interventions? We only have one position for birth as obstetricians. Midwives over the years have uh, used different positions. I remember the first time I uh, moved to the Birmingham Women's from Egypt uh, as an SHO, and I was crash called into one of the rooms because there was a deceleration, and I walked into the room, and the woman was on all fours. And to my shock, I just couldn't understand what was happening. I just looked at the midwife, and I said, what's this? And, and she said, she's having a baby, uh, because in Egypt, everybody, everybody is, lies on their back and have a baby. Um, so I said, can you just put her the right way around so that at least I know what I'm doing, because I, I didn't even know what I'm going to do in, uh, in that situation. Interestingly, when you look at deliveries in lateral position, and this is a system, systematic review done by one of my intercalated students, Emma Watts, um, and Emma looked at all the literature for randomized and random, non-randomized studies. The evidence from randomized studies is very limited because the studies are very limited as well, number-wise. But in the my studies, there's a significant reduction in the risk of oasis for women delivering in the left lateral compared to the lithotomy position. Likewise, the same thing happens with all fours. So these positions are positions that we as obstetricians, we might not be able to do our forceps or avantus in any of these positions, I agree. However, at least if a woman is being counseled about reducing risks, we need really to think about um, these as, as options available and not deter women from, uh, from having these positions. Episiotomy. Episiotomy is the second most common surgical procedure in medicine. What's the first most common surgical procedure in medicine? Absolutely. Cutting the umbilical cord. We think it's one operation, but actually it's not. If you have an episiotomy in America, it's a midline incision. If you have it in Birmingham, it's a right mediolateral incision. If you have it in the Netherlands, it's a left mediolateral incision. If you have it in, um, in um, uh, Norway, it's a right lateral episiotomy. If you have it in Finland, it's a left lateral episiotomy. But we think it's just one operation. And we look at the evidence and decide this is the evidence about episiotomy. Yes, episiotomy is horrible, it's terrible, it increases the risk of third degree tear. When you look at, and this is a Danish database of about 85,000 women, when you look over the years, what has happened to episiotomies, we started from doing routine episiotomies to being very restrictive. And the, the figure at the top just shows the rate of obstetric inner sphincter injury happening in that hospital um, over a period of time and the rate of episiotomy in the same hospital. I agree, this might be a variation in classification. This indeed could be um, uh, uh, maybe variation in the accuracy of diagnosis, but there's also probably a link between both. So we certainly strongly recommend that people would not consider going down the route of very, very restrictive episiotomy. What about the angle of episiotomy? Angle of episiotomy is very important. Um, the team in, um, in Dublin have published data showing that every six degrees away from the, uh, the perpendicular line, the risk of, uh, of oasis reduces significantly. But actually people over the years, certainly Dr. Cello was the first one, when, uh, when he was a research fellow in Liverpool, he got people to draw um, a line as to where they would cut an episiotomy. The majority of people were cutting episiotomies at very small angles. This was replicated by um, Andrew Vesanth, Abdul Sultan's research fellow, and certainly replicated by us, and this was published recently, using our perineal trauma model. We got 200 experienced doctors and midwives in the UK to cut episiotomies. And only 12% of these cut a correct mediolateral episiotomy. 
most of the episiotomies were nearly midline episiotomies, having very, very small angles. So you are creating a tear that is going to extend to the anal sphincter. So my third conclusion for this talk is that selective episiotomy policy is best rather than routine, of course, or very restrictive. You have to be very attentive to the type of episiotomy, observe your junior doctors, especially that in the UK in particular, we have junior doctors coming from different parts of the world. Everybody practices something slightly different. Manual perineal support. This is a, quite a big topic. Do we support the perineum? Don't we support the perineum? Or what tra tra traditionally people call hands-on, hands-off technique? Katharina Lane, who is a member of the peers group, is Finnish, but she moved to Norway about 18 years ago. And when she went to Norway, she was shocked at how many obstetric anal sphincter injuries happen compared to Finland. Finland is the, the, the uh, graph at the bottom. The risk was just hovering um, around half a percent compared to 4% in Norway. But her observation was, this was linked that, to the fact that they were not doing this technique, which they, what they use in Finland, where they control the delivery of the head and support the perineum. So she started a, a quality improvement program and in, introduced this in Norway. And this is what happened to Oasis rates in Norway over a period of time. So manual perineal support seems to work. The only problem about it is that these are non-randomized studies. So there is a big, huge bias within that. When we looked at randomized trials in a systematic review that is coming out in Bijog um, soon, there was no difference whatsoever between whether you do hands-on or hands-off. But these are very small studies. When we looked at the non-randomized studies, these involve more than 60,000 women, a significant reduction in the risk of oasis. So the potential is huge for us to do so. And this applies to when we do instrumented deliveries. You'll be surprised, actually, how many um, doctors do a Vantuz delivery and they don't support the perineum at all. Um, even if they support it to the delivery of the head, they just forget about it when they deliver the shoulders. And a lot of oasis happen at that time. So there is a potential benefit for manual perineal support, and certainly an RCT is very urgently required, because practice in the UK would not change unless if there is an RCT. Trauma repair, and these are uh, Cochrane reviews that have been around for a while. These came from our groups. We used the continuous uh, technique using a fast absorbing suture material, and this has informed the NICE guidance and lots of um, guidelines um, throughout the, the world. But the interesting thing is we've done a, this is a study that was funded by the ALF Foundation. We've done a, 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 a cluster randomized trial in the UK in 21 units, and we've observed that if people follow the right technique, there is a reduction in the risk of infection. Risk of perineal wound infection happens in the UK to 7 to 10 percent of women. We run a clinic called the Perineal Review Clinic or the Preview Clinic, and in that clinic we see 10 patients a week who are coming with wound problems, which in lots of hospitals throughout the UK are just lost in the community. What happens to wound infection? In the UK, we treat these women expectantly. We ask them to just go away and take some antibiotics, and it will heal eventually. We've got uh, funding from um, uh, the uh, NHR Research for Patient Benefit, and we've run a feasibility study, the preview study, um, and when we looked, this is a Cochrane review, which showed limited evidence, and that's why we got the funding. But when we got the funding, we looked at this cohort of women, and we compared ex expectant management with resuturing. And interestingly, the resuturing group, as you would expect, did much better. They healed quicker. They were happy with the outcome. They had less dyspareunia. This is a small study. This is just a feasibility so that we can undertake a bigger study. But why don't we do this in the UK? Why do we, do we ask women to just go uh, uh, away and just sit on a, on a hole in their perineum for a few weeks, ending up with muscles that are not brought together? Do we do this for any other wound in the body? If somebody comes with a dehist wound in their face or their abdomen, do we just let them go and, and live with it? Some women in the previous study waited 15 weeks for the wound to heal. 15 weeks, nearly four months. And the, one of the big questions for OASIS is whether we do end-to-end -end or overlap repair. Again, the, we've, we've undertaken the repair trial. This is a trial that was designed by the late Professor Johansson, and we carried this trial in several units, including um, Mitch, Tafts, and Shrewsbury. And this, this trial has shown there is no difference whatsoever between doing an end-to-end -end and overlap repair. But the important thing is to be able to recognize the muscle. So training and making sure that your junior doctors are able to recognize the muscle and bring it together, it doesn't matter how they do so, is absolutely crucial. So my conclusions from this is rectal examination before repairing a trauma is essential. We should use the continuous technique. We should use fast absorbing suture material because they reduce infection. Whether you do end-to-end -end or overlap repair for OASIS, it does not matter. 
And I hope that in our, in, at least in my um, uh, ac academic lifetime um, and clinical lifetime, to see that women in the UK are having re-switching rather than expectant management for wound dehiscence and wound breakdown. Seeing this when we counsel women, it is really quite tricky because now we are expected to say everything to women, all the possibilities that can happen to them. And you can sit in the clinic and tell a primary gravity risk of oasis is 5%. The next woman is a multip. You tell her the risk is, is half a percent. But is this woman's risk really 5%? Is it half a percent? We don't know because everybody is different. There are lots of factors. The baby might be big. The woman might be a little bit older than the previous woman. Both of them are still primips. She might be 42 weeks compared to 38 weeks. There are lots of variables that happen. The other important issue is that we know the risk factors. These are the list of risk factors. But what we don't know about is what happens to a woman if she has more than one risk factor. What about if a woman has three or four risk factors? Is her risk still 5%? We don't know that. That's why people have started drifting into trying to develop prediction models. And Abdul and Rani in Croydon have developed a prediction model for predicting if a woman has had levator um, in eye avulsion or not. Um, and interestingly, when you look at the risk factors, the biggest burden of a risk factor is pushing in for second stage, the duration of pushing. So when NICE changes its guidance and tells us that a woman can have four hours from the time she's fully dilated and she delivers, and she can either have a three hour of pushing and an hour of head descent, or two hours of head descent and two hours of pushing, um, is really just a decision that has been made by a group of people thinking, oh, it sounds nice, let's put it this way. But actually, there is no support for this whatsoever. The longer the second stage is, the higher the risk for this woman having an avulsion, the higher the risk for this woman having an oasis. The problem with, with uh, Abdul and Rani, it's not a problem actually, it's a fantastic prediction model, but the, the only issue about it is that it's a post-birth model. So you can actually tell the patient the bad news or the good news afterwards, but you can't really do anything about it beforehand. But this also made us think, can we develop something similar for obstetric anal sphincter injury? And with a team in Denmark, again, using their fantastic database, about 85,000 women, we tried to do that. So we had these women, we excluded the ones who had cesarean section. We then split these women random, uh, randomly into two groups. We developed a prediction model on one half, and we tested this on the other half, which is a methodology that is accepted by uh, di diagnostic accuracy statisticians. Interestingly, the biggest burden is the length of second stage of labor which we seem to be taking it actually quite lightly. When I was a, a, a registrar at the Birmingham Women's Hospital, women were only allowed to push for an hour, and then we did something about it. This has changed significantly now. So consider individualized patient care. Interventions um, that we do significantly modify the risk, and I'm going to take you through a prediction model to show you how it works. I hope it works. It took us a while to get it going on this computer, but we'll see. But before I do so, um, because I won't be able to get back to the, to the PowerPoint, I just want to acknowledge um, the group of people who have generated a lot of the information that I have talked about today uh, related to our group. Of course, the other groups have been acknowledged in the references. And I also want to acknowledge the funders of uh, my program to date. Um, I, I've mentioned several times I come from Egypt. Uh, I'm having treatment to stop putting slides about Egypt in my presentations, but it hasn't worked yet. Um, so. Um, Ancient, uh, in ancient Egypt, people believed in life after death, um, and there was a very important um, god, Osiris, who determined whether somebody is going to go to heaven, which interestingly in Egypt was going back to Egypt, because none of us, if somebody says you're going to come back to where you started, you're going to say, oh my god, I don't want that. Uh, but for Egyptians, going back to Egypt is actually heaven, or you don't, uh, which would be hell. Um, and, and Osiris had this sense of um, looking at somebody doing an OSAT and determining whether they can go or not go. Um, and, um, and so I want to give you the obstetric sphincter injury risk identification system, Osiris. And this is the dodgy part. So um, let's just imagine the perfect patient. Let's say this woman is 18 years old. And let's say, although she's 18, she's having her third baby. And let's say she has done this several times, she knows how to do it, she pushes for less than 30 minutes. This baby is OA, and she's delivering at 38 weeks. We don't think the baby is big, she does not need an instrumental delivery, and she's not going to have an episiotomy. What is her risk of having an obstetric anal sphincter injury? Seven in a thousand. So when you counsel this woman in the clinic, 
you can tell her your risk is seven in a thousand. And let's imagine that this is still a young woman, but she's 42. She's having her first baby because career was more important. She has um, pushed for an hour and the baby is OP and she is 42 weeks because she didn't like induction earlier. Um, let's make it worse, I'm horrible today. So, two hours. <laughs> What's the risk of having an obstetric anal sphincter injury? 13%. And what about if this baby is a bit big because she has been really eating well? 28%. What about if she needs a forceps because she's been pushing for two hours and you know, she's so tired? But the registrar is sensible, so they're going to do an episiotomy, of course. But then if the registrar decided, I've seen it in my previous hospital, you can do forceps without an episiotomy, just a lift out. I'm sure I can do it in the room. I'm not going to do an episiotomy. <laughs> so whatever we do is something that is going to change what happens to the woman significantly throughout the two hours, the 14 hours, or as some patients say, four days. Thank you very much.